Let's take our Bibles, please, and open to uh, John chapter 21, beginning in verse 1. John 21, 1, as we continue. Actually, we're going to finish the book of John today. And the title of our message is An Invitation to Love. You can now take out your smartphones or iPads and follow along the notes with your app. If you don't have it, just search for Calvary Hillsboro and be right with us. Um, I was on vacation last weekend and having some time. Our, our son is here from the Marines and uh, just really enjoyed some time off. Hope you guys all had a great Christmas and starting out the new year well. Uh, I follow along the message with Pastor Matthew last weekend, and I tell you what, what a blessing it was to hear that message. And, and I would say even that that message last weekend was not just a good message, it was an important one. And if you missed it, I really encourage you to, to review it because it really was a very powerful message. But let's get into John 21 this morning. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for revealing your heart. And I pray, oh God, that we would understand and that we would live in the light of it. So God, we honor you as we come into your presence. We open the scriptures and we open our heart and we say, Lord, minister to us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. John 21, you know, as we're beginning the new year, uh, in many ways we see the, dis the disciples entering also newness of life because now they're living in the light of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the resurrection changes everything. And I think it's important for us to understand that, to live in the light of the resurrection is a powerful declaration that God is doing something new in us because the power by which Jesus was raised from the dead, the scripture says, is the same power of God that moves in our lives in transforming us. Think about what the resurrection does in its changing of so many things. Even change the, the meaning of a cross. You know, in those days, a cross uh, was a symbol of terror and fear. If someone was to see a cross, uh, it was an instrument of cruelty and death. They would, it would, they would shudder, you know, their heart begin to raise and get sweaty. The, oh, the fear associated with the cross. But now, because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, a cross is associated with hope. It is a symbol of God's love for us because it declares how much God loved us in sending his own son to die upon the cross and taking our sins upon himself. And the resurrection of, of Jesus Christ changes that. Today, uh, it's a symbol of hope. We make jewelry from it. We, we put it in the church because it is a symbol that God has now transformed. Also, death itself has been transformed. Uh, it was before a symbol uh, or a, a, a thought of last end, curtain closed, end of hope. But now because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, it is in fact not the end, it is the beginning. And in fact, the great newness of life is found when we breathe our last because that's when we enter into the presence of the living God. It's a powerful declaration that it's made new. Death has been conquered, we've been set free. Also, it changes the way we live right now. See, the resurrection's changed our lives. Before, all we could hope for was found here on earth. The purpose, the meaning of life, all centered here on the material, those things that are earthly. But now, because of the resurrection, all of those things are, are like unimportant when compared to the eternal weight of glory, the scripture says. Uh, we've been set free to live free to live in the hope, the light of the resurrection changes everything. I recently heard the testimony of, of a man who when he was a, a child, uh, he lived in a home where his, his father was very angry. He was, was an alcoholic uh, father, very, very angry. And uh, the boy found himself very, very troubled uh, as a boy. But one of his neighbors thought that he would give him a little gift. And he lived in the country, and his neighbor gave him a little lamb, actually a little, a little baby lamb to take care of. And so it, it was an opportunity to have a relationship with something tender and near to him. And it became his, his friend. And in fact, this lamb would be waiting for him at the bus when he would get off and uh, walk together up the long drive, you know. And it was just a really tender, beautiful thought for something that was so... A precious to have in a life that was so filled with turmoil and anguish. One day he got off the bus and the lamb was not there waiting for him. And he went up the long drive in great 
wonder. And he found his father uh, in an angry rage, changing a, a tire on the car. And he, he went around the other side, and there was his lamb. His father, in a drunken rage, has taken the tire iron and killed his lamb for no reason at all. The lamb was just curious. And he ran into the woods crying and screaming, never forgiving his father, and changed from that moment into hatred. He hated everything. He hated life. He hated himself. He hated his father. He hated everyone. And his, his, his teenage years became uh, troubled in and out of institutions. His twenties became troubled for him in and out of jail. Difficult, hated person. One day he got into a fight. And uh, the man he was fighting with fell amongst some bottles. He grabbed a broken bottle then and, and cut him. And it severed an, a major artery in his arm, severed his muscles and his artery, and he began to bleed to death. And he continued to fight until so someone said, you've got to get to the hospital. They called an ambulance. Uh, the ambulance took him to the hospital, and he died. But he was revived. You know, uh, one of those experiences, and later he said, you know, people relate that those are experiences are often, they see this beautiful thing, not for me. He said it was terror. My heart was filled with hatred, and the experience of death was, was terror and fear. And so after he got out of the hospital, he found his way to a church trying to find an answer. So he was listening to this pastor speaking. And the pastor began to tell him about a lamb who had died. He said, when he mentioned a lamb that had died, he got my attention then. And I began to understand love for the first time in my life. Because he told me that it was for love that the lamb who was the son had died. He said, I had never known love until that moment. But love changed everything. And he himself became a radically changed man. And that is the hope of the gospel. It makes all things new. And he wants to make us new. And in fact, the story of John 21 is the restoring of relationship, making all things new. Let's realize that story in John 21, beginning in verse 1. Let's read it together. After these things, Jesus manifested himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. That's another name for the Sea of Galilee. And he manifested himself in this way. There were together Simon Peter, uh, Thomas called Didymus, or the twin, uh, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, that's James and John, and two other of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, well, we'll come with you. And so they went out and got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. Now let's kind of put this in our minds for a moment. When it says that night they caught nothing. Literally what it means is they fished all night. In that culture and day, uh, they would fish at night. A professional would fish at night. Now, in our country, we're not allowed to fish at night because it's an unfair advantage. And so what they would do is they would get on their boat at night and they would have a net. And they would throw the net out and uh, it would kind of circular net with weights around the perimeter. And after they threw it into the, the sea, it would sink, of course, and, and make the shape and surround any fish, get to the bottom. They would pull the, the net closed and encompass, hopefully, some fish. Um, it's interesting because uh, whenever you go to Israel, we were just there, as you know, in October. And uh, going out on the Sea of Galilee is one of the special parts of the trip to Israel. There's something so special about being on a boat and, and being in the, you know, on the Sea of Galilee. And uh, they, they turn on worship. And it's just a moving experience. And uh, they always then stop the boat out there in the middle and uh, let it drift a bit in the wind. And then they'll say, okay, now we're going to fish for your dinner. Of course, and it's, it's a joke because impossible. You're not going to catch any fish during the daytime. But nevertheless, it's a great experience, you know, to see how they do it. And they throw this. Oh, great. And so, but they would fish at night. That's how you fish. And so all night long, you got to see this all night long, throwing the net, bring it back in, throwing the net. That's how you fish. Throw the net, bring it back in all night long. And they caught nothing. 
And then it goes on. Now, when the day was breaking, just at sunrise, Jesus stood on the beach. But the disciples did not know that it was him. They didn't recognize him. Jesus therefore said to them, children, literally, boys, you don't have any fish, do you? And uh, they said, no. So he said to them, well, cast your net on the right-hand side of the boat, and you'll find a catch. They cast, therefore, and then they were not able to haul it in because of the great number of fish. This is really an amazing part of the story. Cast your net on the right side of the boat. You know what's interesting is, uh, as they were standing there fishing all night long, they hears a man standing on the shore. They don't recognize who it is. He just calls out to them, hey, boys, you don't have any fish, do you? No, we don't. Very common for fishermen, you know, to call out to each other. No, we don't have any. Hey, you ever try tossing on the right-hand side of the boat? I just wonder what was in their minds when they heard that. You know, they don't know who it is. They don't know it's the Lord. They think it's just some guy standing on the beach telling them, throw it on the right-hand side of the boat. I'm thinking they, they must have thought in their minds, like, are you crazy? What do you think we've been doing all night long? We've been throwing it all the You think on the right-hand side doesn't make any difference? But they do it. They throw on the right side and a great haul of fish. And then the story continues. They cast, therefore, verse 7 says, That disciple, therefore, whom Jesus loved, we know that's John, he said to Peter, it's the Lord. I know this one. That's the Lord. So when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put his outer garment on because he was stripped for work, and he threw himself into the sea. The other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from the land, about a hundred yards away, dragging the net full of fish. And so when they got out upon the land, they saw a charcoal fire already laid and fish placed upon it, and bread. Jesus has a fire, fish cooking on the shore. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish which you have now caught. Simon Peter went up, drew the net to land, full of large fish, 153. Someone counted. We have exact 153. And although there were so many, the net was not torn interesting story. We're going to read more of this, but I want to go back over these verses and understand what, <coughs> excuse me, what God would do for us as we look at this story. Because the, the story is really in many ways about failure. In many ways, we have to understand God's heart here is to redeem, to take hold of, to transform. And one of the lessons that we've got to see is that God transforms failure. Uh, Jesus had told the disciples in advance that he was going to die, and that he would rise again and meet them in Galilee. So they had the faith to go to Galilee. They went to the northern shores of the sea and waited. They waited. And finally, Peter said, I'm going fishing. So the disciples say, we'll go with you. They fish all night. They catch nothing. See, what's interesting, it's important to recognize, is that Jesus told Peter, from now on, you will be a fisher of men. He had told them this, but Peter is going back to catching fish. Now, you know this is not a recreational fishing trip. Okay, for example, a recreational fishing trip would not be done at night. This is a professional fishing trip. Peter is a professional fisherman, and so he's going to do it as a professional at night. He's stripped for work. This is not just a, hey, while we're waiting... Since Jesus is not right here, what do you say we take a little, you know, little trip and go fishing? No, no. This is a professional fishing excursion. They caught nothing. God let them fail. This is important to see, but God's going to transform their failure. It's a theme of these verses, and this is not the first of Peter's failures either. Let's look at this, because God would use it. We all understand failure. We're all familiar with it. But one of the things we need to see is that failure shows us our weakness. We need to see it. Failure shows us our weakness. Failure often comes when we rely on ourselves. Peter was relying on himself when he went back to going fishing, reverting back to his old profession. He was relying on himself also when he had promised that he would stand by the Lord. This is a very important moment. When he made a promise, he's going to stand by the Lord even if the rest of the disciples fell away. In fact, let's look at that story. That's in Mark 14. Would you turn there? 
Mark 14 in verse 27. Mark 14, verse 27, let's read this story because it's a very important part of the background of what's happening in John 21. Jesus said to them, you will all fall away, which is to say, you're all going to fail tonight. You will all fall away because it is written, I'll strike down the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter said to to him, look, even though all may fall away, I will not. What was Peter saying here? It's very important to really see it. Essentially, he's saying to the Lord, you know, when I look at these disciples that you've chosen, I can understand why you would say that they would fall. I really see them as those who could fall. But I want you to understand something. I'm not like them. I'm different. I love you more. I will not fall away. They may, I will not fall away. So interestingly, Jesus responded and said, truly, Peter, I say to you that you yourself, this very night, before the rooster crows twice, you shall three times have denied me. Peter kept saying insistently, which is to say what? No, you're wrong. You are wrong. He's insisting, no, it's not going to be so. In fact, he goes on and says, look, verse 31, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And then they all said the same thing too. Oh yeah, us too. See, going back to John 21, it's about failure. They've been fishing all night, failed to produce even one fish after fishing all night. It's interesting, relying on himself, Seems to me that Peter has a common problem, overconfidence. We all can understand this, over-relying on ourselves. Interestingly, it seems that we have two problems. One is over-relying on ourselves, and the other is thinking very terrible thoughts about ourselves. And in fact, it's interesting, Peter's overconfidence and self-reliance went down in the flames of failure. But then his shame and his regret caused him to be broken and weep very deeply, if you remember the story. But see, when you go to John 21, one of the great lessons that we have to see now is that God's presence changes everything to understand what it means to live in the light of the resurrection. I will be with you. God's presence changes everything. When Jesus appears on the shore, he tells them to cast the nets on the right-hand side. They enclose a great quantity of fish, Peter, or John recognizes, I know this one. I know this one. This is the Lord. Immediately, they were reminded of when they first met the Lord. Isn't this just like the first time? Remember? The very first day we met him? This is exactly what happened. In fact, let's go to that story. Would you open your Bibles to Luke chapter 5? Let's look at this story, because it's all part of the story of John 21. Luke 5, beginning in verse 1. The very first day they met him. Now it came about that while the multitude were pressing around Jesus and listening to the word of God, that he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, another uh, name for the Sea of Galilee. And he saw two boats lying at the edge of the lake, but the fishermen had gotten out of them and were washing their nets. Now he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's. And I have to wonder if this perhaps wouldn't be the same exact boat, Simon's boat. So he gets into Simon's boat, and he asked him to put out a little way from the land. So he sat down, and he began to teach the multitudes from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, hey, put out into the deep water and and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered and said, "Uh, (laughs) Master, we worked all night. And we caught nothing, but at your bidding, I'll let down the nets. Now, uh, this scene to me is is very much like this. They've been working all night, catching the fish, uh, excuse me, working at it. They caught nothing. Jesus wants to use the boat for a teaching moment. So Simon, Peter, he accommodates. They're out there. He's speaking, and Peter's, you know, waiting patiently. And then afterwards, Jesus says, hey, put out in the deep water. And, and let down your nets. Peter responds. He resists this. 
as though he's saying, look, uh, you don't fish in the daytime, okay? We've been fishing all night long. We've caught nothing. If we caught nothing at night, we're surely going to catch nothing now. However, you know, uh, at your bidding, as you wish, if you want to go out, maybe you're interested in fishing. You want to see how we do it? I'll show you how we do it. You can kind of see a little bit of patronizing. Okay, if you want to see, all right, we'll go. So he puts out in the deep, and it tells us in the story that when they had done this, they enclosed a great quantity of fish, and their nets began to break. And so they signaled to their partners in the other boat for them to come and help them. And they came and filled both of the boats so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw that, he fell down at Jesus' feet and he said, Depart from me. I'm a sinful man, O Lord. He recognized, he doesn't fully know who he is yet, but he knows he's a man of God, a holy man. And he says, Apart, Depart from me, I'm a sinful man, Lord. For amazement had seized him and all the companions because of the catch of fish which they had taken. And so also James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. So Jesus said to Simon, do not fear. From now on, you will be catching men. And they brought their boats to land, and they left everything, and they followed him. This was the first day. So back in John 21, Peter recognizes it. John recognizes it. The Lord's presence changes everything. But here in John 21, they failed again until the Lord's presence. The Lord changes everything. Sometimes the Lord allows us to fail in our self-reliance in order to prepare us for the blessing that's going to come from the touch of his hand, the blessing of his presence. One of the best scriptures I know about that is Psalm 127. One of my favorite verses in all the Bible is Psalm 127, verses 1 to 2. Unless the Lord builds the house... They labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman keeps awake in vain. What's the word vain mean? It means empty. He said, look, it's vain for you to rise up early, to retire late, to eat the bread of painful labors, <clears throat> for it is he, it's he who gives to his beloved even while he's sleeping. Oh, the presence of the Lord changes everything. Self-reliance, when you look at those scriptures, Psalm 127, self-reliance can build the house, but it's in vain. Self-reliance can guard the city, but it's in vain. Unless the Lord does it, unless the Lord builds the house, unless the Lord guards the city, his presence changes everything. But that's the promise. That's the promise of the resurrection. Jesus said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, and lo, I am with you, even to the end of the age. Oh, if we could only understand what it means to live in the light of the resurrection. For the same power by which Jesus was raised from the dead is the power by which Jesus is now moving in our lives. Do you believe this? Because the understanding of that will transform how we live now. But one of the things we need to also understand, very important, is this, that success can be a snare and a ruin. This is what I mean. We can do worse than fail. We can succeed and be proud of the success. Or we can worship the success or the net or forget the hand of the one who supplies all things. Mark 5, verse, 44, uh, verse 45, Jesus is teaching it is he who causes his son to rise on the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. God's hand blesses. It's a recognition of that. There's a, an author who wrote this. He said, success, even spiritual success, can be a snare and a ruin, while failure can be an unspeakable benefit. Failure is often the only test by which the real worth and quality of a man or woman can be tried. It is in failure that a man begins to think, to wonder from where his failure came, to look around and seek for reasons, to put his work double watchfulness, and to look upward to him who can turn failure into glorious achievement. See, one of the great lessons of life I've learned and, you know, as you move through life, don't you, like, seize upon treasures of wisdom? 
try to lock them down because they are so important. One of the great lessons of life that I've learned is that one of the worst things that can happen to a person is to do the wrong thing and win. To do the wrong thing and win is one of the worst things that can happen because you're going to repeat the thing that was wrong and will have learned nothing. Or worse, you will think that you don't need God. Interestingly, when Israel was just about to enter into the Holy Land, they were going to enter a land flowing with milk and honey and abundance and blessing. But God gave them a warning. In Deuteronomy 8, verses 17 to 18, he says, Otherwise, you may say in your heart, It was my power and the strength of my hand that made me this wealth. But you shall remember the Lord your God. It's he, he who is giving you power to make wealth, that he may confirm his covenant which he swore to your fathers as it is to this day. The hand of God blesses. He, his presence, changes everything. John 21, they failed. They had worked all night long. What is the the work all night long, throwing and pulling and throwing. He's stripped for work. It's a hard thing. Effort, self-effort, great work. But the presence of God changes everything. That's when they brought a great haul of fish. Interestingly, someone counted it, and there were 153 fish. I have read uh, so many commentators uh, suggesting what it might mean that there were exactly 153 and, uh, you know, when I, when I imagine all of these different uh, ideas of what it might mean, I kind of wonder if the disciples, you know, they were all kind of seeing this great net of fish, and someone decided to count it, and then someone said, hey, guess what, guys? There's so many fish here. There's 153 fish. And then somebody said, 153? Did you say 153? That, that I can't believe that number, because that number is very significant. I said, really? What is it? Well, don't you know, 51 times 3 is 153. Okay, but what is the significance of that? Well, don't you know that 17 times 3 is 51, and 51 times 3 is 153? Okay, what's the significance of that? Well, 10 and 7 is like the Ten Commandments, and 7 is always a number that describes the perfection of God. Don't you get it? Well, not really. Well, how about this? Did you know that 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 all the way to 17 is exactly 153? See, my whole point, yes, that is true. The whole point, the whole point is like, what does that number mean? You know what I think it means? I think it means this. I think that fishermen like counting fish. If you've ever been fishing, you know exactly what I'm saying. But now going back to John 21, the point is, hey, it was the hand of God. That's the point. It's the hand of God. It's the presence of the Lord. But now the next part of the scripture is so important because it's about love. And here's the thing we need to see. God is going to pursue Simon Peter to reconcile him. Simon Peter failed. Oh, did he fail. Worse than all of them. Something's going to have to be done. This has to be addressed. Let's read the story John 21, verse 12, Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples ventured to question, who are you, knowing it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, gave it to them and the fish. This is now the third time that Jesus manifested to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. Now, when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Do you love me more than these? Now, we know that this is a private conversation. We're going to get that from the context of this. Jesus called Simon Peter for a little walk. This failure is going to have to be addressed. Peter had made great promises. The rest of them, I can understand, they will fail. But I will not. But he failed worse than all of them. A great lesson. We all understand what it means to fail. Every one of us knows what it means to fail. And when we do, we need to know the heart of God in it and after us. We feel the shame. Everyone who's ever failed knows the shame that goes with it. We're embarrassed. 
You don't feel worthy to be in the presence of God because you're very much aware of your sin. Everybody can relate because everybody has experienced it. Some people feel so unworthy that they even say to themselves, what's the use of trying? I'm, I'm a failure anyway. I might as well give up and stop trying to be righteous. What's the use? Why? I've, I've already failed. Why even try? If you have those thoughts, if you have those thoughts, can I say something to you in love? Stop it. Stop it right now because this is important. You are allowing your flesh to convince you of something that is not God's heart. See, don't allow this. What a clever thing for your flesh to say. What a clever thing for your flesh to say. To use your shame against you so that you'll stay defeated. Hey, hasn't the flesh had too much victory already? Let's give him no more. That's not God's heart for you. God's heart for you is to be reconciled. And interestingly, love is the first and highest priority. See, in order for Peter to be restored, love had to be, re to be reconciled. See, this is important. Let's learn and apply it to our own lives. Love God as your highest priority because it's the highest priority of the Lord. It's his highest priority. It's his highest desire for you. Jesus was asked, what is the highest and foremost of all the laws that God has ever given? Jesus responded, you shall love. It's God's highest priority. It should be ours. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Peter's got to be reconciled in love. See, what happened between Peter and Jesus cannot go unspoken. It had to be addressed. It had to be worked out. It's a, you can imagine Peter and, 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 and Jesus walking together. I can just imagine Jesus saying, in, in essence to him, Peter, we've got to talk this out. And in fact, in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18, there's a similar heart to Israel. Come now, he says. Let's reason together. Let's work this out. Come now. Let me tell you the heart of the Lord. Isaiah 1, 18 tells us, Come now, let's reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, they will be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they will be like wolves. It's interesting that he uses the color of red to describe sin. It reminds us, of course, is the blood of Christ. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin, the scripture says. Come now, though your sins are as scarlet, they will be white as snow. This is the heart of the Lord. Be reconciled. It's God's heart. When Peter failed, it was as though he were saying, I love you more. Jesus asked him here in John 21, Simon, son of John, do you love me more? Do you love me more than these? Peter responded, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And then Jesus followed, then tend my lambs. Now see, the significance of these verses right here, very important. But the significance of these verses is only revealed to us if we understand a bit of the Greek language. See, we have one word, love. And that word, love, is used in many uh, ways, and it has many different meanings. For example, I can say, I love my wife. I can say, I love golf. And I can say, I love apple pie with ice cream. I'm using the same word, love, in each of those phrases, yet each of them means something different. At least they better. If I say, I love my wife, and I love apple pie with ice cream, they better be different things. And so this is important for us to understand. In the Greek language, there are many words that are translated into the English as love. But they're very different words with different meanings. For example, there's the word eros, love. Um, this is physical, sensual desire and longing. We get the word erotic from it. It's eros, love. Then there's another Greek word, phileo, love. This is a friendship general type of love between family and friends. The city Philadelphia is used uh, after that same word, brotherly love. Then there's agape. This is the deepest sense of love, the, the true unconditional love, love that's selfless, love that gives and expects nothing in return, agape love. 
the deepest form, the highest significance. Interestingly, we do have kind of a, a sense of distinctions of relationship in English. We, we, we kind of phrase it differently, but we kind of have a very similar thing. In other words, when a girl says to a guy, let's just be friends, it's kind of distinguishing the difference in their relationship because everybody knows that's code. Everybody knows that's code for, I really can't stand you and I'll have nothing to do with you from here forth. Let's be friends. Although it's interesting because I remember uh, my wife, uh, before she was my wife, we were in this uh, band, worship band together, and I liked her. And, uh, you know, and uh, I was making my interest known, and uh, which, you know, guys know exactly what I'm saying. I was making my interest known, and uh, she picked that up, and so she said, you know what, I think we need to go for a little walk. Ah, oh, he does the walk, Okay. So we go for the walk, and she says, I can tell that you, you don't like me and stuff, but listen, can we just be friends? Oh, here's the let's be friends thing. I can't believe it. I went down in flames. I was, I was so disappointed. I was so down. I mean, like for 30 seconds, I was so down <laughs> because it occurred to me. Wait a minute. Did I, did I hear her say, let's be friends? Let's be friends. Let's be friends. Let's be friends. I call my friends. I do things with my friends. Yes, let's be friends. And the rest, my friends, is history. <laughs> but all right, back to our story. So Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? Now he used the word agape love. Peter, do you have the deepest selfless love? unconditional love for me? Come back to this, Peter. Come back to true unconditional love. Peter's making no bold claims now. He carries his shame. He carries his failure. And he says, yes, Lord, you know that I phileo you. I have friendship love for you. Is it possible to have an inadequate type of love for God? Is it possible for us to have an inadequate type of love for God? I think yes. There is an experience of God. There is an experience of God that someone feels in, in, in the moments of, of intimate worship. For example, you feel moments of passion. And believe me, this is very important, very significant part of our relationship to the Lord. But people can feel the, 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 the feeling, the experience of God in that moment of passion, yet they don't want the commitment of selfless, unconditional love. They want the experience of passion during those moments, but they don't want the commitment of selfless, unconditional love. See, when Jesus spoke of the highest and foremost of loves, he said, you shall love the Lord your God he used the word agape. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and your soul and your mind and your strength. So back to John 21, he says to him, Simon, son of John, do you agape love? Yes, Lord, you know that I phileo love. He said, tend my lambs. So he said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you have agape love? He said, yes, Lord, you know that I phileo love. He said, shepherd my sheep. The third time, he said, Simon, son of John, do you have phileo love? Can affirm this. Do you have a, a phileo love? Lord, it says Peter was grieved when he heard him say the third time, do you have phileo love? So he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I do phileo love. He said, tend my sheep. And then he goes on. Jesus goes on. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were younger, you used to gird yourself, walk wherever you wished. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands. He's signifying here the death. He's going to die. Peter is going to be crucified. Although, interestingly, Peter... You're going to see the, 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 pro, the progress, the growing in Peter. 
As you go through the scriptures, you see this growing in Peter. To the point when he dies, he does get crucified. At least church history tells us that. But when he was crucified, he said, I will not be crucified in the same way that my Lord was. I don't want anyone to think that I am at his place of glory. Crucify me upside down. And they did it. So, interesting. Then Jesus said, verse 19, this is the death that you would die, he was signifying. And then he said to him, now you follow me, follow me. See, come back to this, Peter, come back to love. Now you follow me. See, this is important. Love God by following him if you love God. There's that selfless, unconditional love. Okay, Lord, I'll follow you. I'll follow you. Selfless. This is not about me anymore. It's about what you desire, because you're going to bless my life. Selfless. He said, okay, then shepherd my sheep. Shepherd my sheep. Feed my flock. This is the heart of the Lord. He's just saying to Peter, Peter, I don't want you going back to fishing. I want you to be a shepherd. I want you to tend, because that's my heart. That's my heart. Care for the ones that I love. Ezekiel 34, 15 to 16 is God's heart. I'll feed my flock, God says. I will lead them to rest. God loves. I'm going to lead you to rest, God said. I will seek the lost. I'm going to bring back the scattered. I'm going to bind up the broken and strengthen the sick. Interesting little development at the end here. Peter turns around, verse 20, and he saw the disciple whom Jesus loved. That's John. And uh, verse 21 tells us that Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, Lord, what about him? What about this man? Jesus said to him, and you please note a little correction from the Lord. Jesus said to him, if I want him to remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. It's so tempting to compare ourselves to others. Can I say something? That will rob you of life. If you compare yourself, what about him? What about her? She has this. She, he's got that. I, I want. So what? Well, stop. Stop comparing yourself to others. God gives grace to each one of us to live the purpose of God in our lives. Live that, he says. Trust me. Follow me. In Ephesians 4, 7, it says, To each one of us, grace has been given according to the measure of Christ's gift. God loves each one of us individually. And blesses our life. Oh, if we could learn to live in the presence of God. Oh, if we could live in the light of the resurrection. It changes everything. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your invitation to love you. An invitation to be right with you. You've called us to love you with the highest agape love. The deepest love of loving you with all of our heart. And God, this morning we declare it. We love you with all of our heart. And church, as you are praying, as we are before the presence of the Lord, would you say that as you're beginning this new year, you know what we need? We need revival. This year, let it be a year of loving the Lord as your highest priority. But what kind of love? The deepest love. Agape love. Selfless, unconditional love. Jesus is calling us inviting us to have that kind of love. Would you say to the Lord, I will love you with all of my heart. I will love you with all of my heart. Just raise your hand and say that. God, I want you to know this. I will love you with all of my heart. You've invited me to have that reconciliation that comes with it. God, I want you to know it. Here's my heart. I love you. Father, we are so thankful for your heart after us. We honor you as we come into your presence. In Jesus' name, and everyone said,